Well, good morning. Glad you are here today and that you've come to join us. You uh, uh, have made a wise choice to be out today on the Lord's Day to gather for worship, and we're very, very thankful for that. In John chapter 4 and verse 24, the Bible says that God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So we want to encourage you to join into our worship heartily this morning as we try to do the things that God wants us to do. And you're in store for a treat instead of treatment. Uh, Jared is going to be preaching for us this morning. And uh, Eric's going to be leading us in our songs. And uh, just want you to participate, listen along, follow along, join in the singing, participate in the, uh, the prayers. And as you can see in front of me, that uh, we have a guest card maybe in front of you uh, in the pew uh, that you would fill out if you're a guest. We'd sure appreciate that. You just leave it on the pew. Uh, before you leave today, and we'll have a record of that. Uh, at the appropriate time, we'll partake of the Lord's Supper together. Hopefully you got uh, the elements of the Lord's Supper. If you didn't, if you raise your hand now, somebody will get them to you. Anybody get missed or forgotten? Okay. All right, let's bow for prayer as we begin. Our Father, we are so blessed and so thankful to know you. We appreciate all that you've done for us, all that you are how you've cared for us in, in a thousand ways and taken care of us through the years and uh, provided for us. We are thankful for this gathering today, thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to open up your word together, to sing songs together, to gather around the table together, to contribute, lay by and store uh, together as we do these things each week to honor you and glorify you. Lord, what a blessing it is for us to know you. We pray that you'll enthuse us and help us to reach out to those around us, our neighbors, our friends, uh, people that we're associated with, and try to share the good news with them as well. And as we gather for worship today, help our hearts to soar as we see you sitting on your throne, and that we give you the praise that you deserve for all that you've done. Bless us as we try to do your will, and as we live each day here on this earth. In the name of Jesus, we're praying. Amen. Eric? Good morning. Our first song this morning is We Bow Down. of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You are Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we crown you. Bow down and we worship you, Lord, we bow down. And we worship you, Lord, Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were King of the heavens before there was time, and King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. We bow down and we crown you the king. King of all kings you will be. Our song before the prayer is Hosanna. Mm. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name. 
hearts full of praise, so be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full, hearts full of praise, so be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the King of kings. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full, hearts full of praise, so be exalted, O Lord my God, Hosanna in the highest. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing in Christ alone.
In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand.
but it does not mean that. The next two words, and the next very, very next verse says, but God. I want you to think with me this morning before we go to Acts, the second chapter. I want you to think with me about the three years previous that Jesus has started his ministry, he's going around, he's gathering support, and he's gathering those that, that believe in him, and he has this big following. You know, the day uh, that we just sang about Hosanna is where they came and, and, and he was going into Jerusalem on that donkey. And they were laying down the, the, uh, the branches in front of them and the coats and hollering Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the house. And he gathered all that up and he had all of his disciples understanding that he was king, king of the Jews. And that's who he was. But then, it seems that the power of the darkness took over and took Jesus and crucified him and threw him in the grave. And Peter and were left with, what do we do now? On the day of Pentecost, though, Peter did exactly what Jesus wanted him to do. He stood up and he gave a sermon. And in the 36th verse, he said, So let everyone and Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. There was no defeat. There was only a win. And the devil just doesn't see it. And a lot of times in the world, you don't see it. But remember the first two words in verse 4 of Ephesians 2. Says, but God. God doesn't operate the same way that man does. God doesn't see the same things man does. He operates totally different. And he's not left us all along. Let us pray. For oh God, our Father, we are so thankful for our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ that came to this earth and died at some cost. As a sacrifice that we might have forgiven for sins. Father, the man's wish and the all of us doesn't see why that had to happen. We don't understand it. We don't understand how it could happen. Maybe you don't understand how you can stand by and see your son be sacrificed like that. But God, we also know that you are all knowing and all and, and know all things and have all best interests in your and your thoughts on your mind. We are so thankful that you sent your son to be that sacrifice that we not have permission of our sins and forgiveness of sins. Thank you for everything. Be with us as we take this bread that we may take a small part of Jesus and remember that it represents his body. And then as we take it, we remember that we are our body now. In Jesus' name we pray. The blood that is so precious to us that we know that no man can do without it. And the blood that was given that is so priceless for us, for our forgiveness, for our sacrifice. Be with us as we take over, help us to remember our Lord and our Savior and the blood that He shed for us in Jesus' name.
our lesson this morning. We'll sing Lily of the Valley. Let's be standing as we sing. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Lily of the Valley in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, 
the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me so, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, what a fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Good morning. I want to join Jody in commending each of you for being here this morning. There's Even under normal circumstances, there's a lot of excuses and reasons we can give to, to not be with God's people and to worship him together. Uh, so the fact that you've all made the choice to be here today during all of these uh, uncertain times and even a, a storm this morning it is uh, in especially, especially encouraging to me, and I want you to know that. A couple of announcements I want to make before we get into the lesson. Um, I want to tell you about a couple of opportunities. Uh, I've been uh, putting forward a series of lessons on our YouTube page. I've titled them Back to Basics. I've been creating those with our teens and young people in mind in particular, but I do think that they have application for really anyone. Uh, right now we're going through the Bible and talking not specifically about specific books, but we're talking about uh, how we got the Bible, why we should study the Bible. We're going to get into uh, very practical discussions of, you know, you're going to study a book. How do you go about doing that? How do you go about breaking it down? Our, our next lesson will be available this Wednesday, and uh, you can find out more about that on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. Another opportunity for our teens uh, specifically, we're continuing to have Zoom meetings for our teens. Those are not really uh, Bible study intensive, but they're really just an opportunity for us to continue to stay connected and engage with each other. And our next one will be the following, not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday. I forgot to, to write down what date that is, but not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday at 8 o'clock will be our next one. You can find a link to that on our Facebook page, Instagram. I'll send out an email as well with that. Uh, so just a couple of opportunities I wanted you to be aware of. Whenever I'm reading my Bible or studying my Bible, there, there's a lot of things I try to look out for, but one of those things is repetition. Whether it's repetition of certain phrases or patterns, I think it's important to, to note those things. And a, and a phrase that I, I've noticed coming up again and again in my studies lately is a phrase, get up and go, or some variation of that. Get up and go. The Bible is full of instances where God tells someone to get up and go somewhere. In, in Genesis chapter 12, when we're first introduced to Abraham, God tells him, go forth from your country to a land that I will show you. Moses, after he kills the Egyptian uh, slaver and flees to Midian, in Exodus chapter 3, God appears to him in the burning bush, and he essentially tells him, get up and go, I'm sending you back to Egypt. Jonah probably remember the story of Jonah. He's told, get up and go to Nineveh. You're going to preach to the Ninevites. And we know how, how that story goes. Jonah flees. He, he goes the opposite direction. He's caught in a storm, thrown overboard, swallowed by a great fish. He spends three nights in that fish, and he's finally thrown up on the shore 
And what does God tell him right after that? Get up and go to Nineveh. Jesus, before he's about to ascend back into heaven, tells his apostles in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Get up and go. And then when we come to the book of Acts, we see over and over again that people are told, get up and go. In in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26, an angel of the Lord speaks to Philip, tells him, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. And there he preaches to an Ethiopian eunuch and and preaches the gospel to him. Acts chapter 9, Paul encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. And after he falls blind, Jesus tells him, get up and go into the city and it will be told what you must do. Acts chapter 10, again, Peter, we see him being told to get up and go preach to a Gentile named Cornelius. And what we see time and time again throughout time, that serving God is not something that can be done from the sidelines. It is not a spectator sport. And when we look at these instances, we see that these men had to lay aside fear. They had to lay aside their biases, their preconceived notions. And in each case, they had to step out of their comfort zone. And so even though in these instances we saw some some light prodding and maybe even some heavy heavy prodding in the story of Jonah, Jonah, we see that God was able to accomplish great things when these men were willing to get up and go. Now this morning I want to talk to you about another instance where someone is told to get up and go. It's not maybe as noteworthy as, as those other instances. You may, be not as, you may not be as familiar with this passage that I'm going to talk to you about. And it's something that if you're just reading through the book of Genesis, I think it's easy to, to just kind of gloss over and not really get much out of. But I think it provides a powerful lesson that I want to share with you through this morning. So turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 35. We're going to start with verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there, and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from your brother brother Esau. Get up and go to Bethel. This is actually not the first time that Jacob has been told to get up and go. Uh, Just to give you a little brief background, background, we're not going to go through the whole story of Jacob, but you might remember that his brother Esau was supposed to have gotten the, the birthright, the blessing from their father Isaac, and Jacob used some, some trickery and was able to get that birthright from Esau. And he flees from Esau because he's afraid of what he's going to do to him. And in Genesis chapter 8, while Jacob is fleeing, he stops in Bethel. And while he's there, he makes a vow in verse 20 and says, If God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. The stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Then if we go forward into Genesis chapter 31, in verse 3, we see God speaking to Jacob, and he says, Return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So God is essentially telling Jacob at this point, okay, everything you vowed to do, you you said that if I take care of you, if I provide you food and clothing, if I protect you, then you're going to come back to Bethel and do these things. And so God is saying to him, not only have you, says your father Isaac, just as Abraham had prospered. And so when we come to chapter 35, this is really the second time that Jacob has been told to go back to Bethel. Just like those other men we talked about, it takes a little bit of prodding. But what I really want to focus on this morning is is the next few verses and what Jacob says to his family, his response to God's call to go to Bethel. And I I think before we do that, it will be helpful for us to think about a couple of events that have happened before this, and I'm just going to mention them briefly. Uh, Later in chapter 31, you remember Jacob married Rachel and Leah, And before they leave uh, Laban's household, we read about in verse 31 that before they leave, 
in chapter 31, verse 17, Jacob arose and put his children and his wives upon camels, and as he drove away all his livestock and all his property which he had gathered, his acquired livestock which he had gathered in Paddan Aram to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac, when Laban had gone to shear his flock, then Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's. And Jacob deceived Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he was fleeing. If we keep reading in chapter 31, we see that Jacob wasn't aware that Rachel had stolen these items, uh, these idols. Then in chapter 34, we read about uh, Jacob's daughter Dinah is defiled by one of the men in Shechem where they had settled. And in response, Simeon and Levi seek out revenge. And so they, they trick the men of Shechem into circumcising themselves. And while they're recovering from that, they go and kill all of the men in the city. And so, aside from the fact that that's just the wrong thing to do, Jacob is now concerned because now there's a target on their back. He says in chapter 34, verse 30, you have brought trouble on me by making me odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and my men being few in number, they will gather against me and attack me, and I will be destroyed, I and my household. So when we come to chapter 35 at this point, God says, okay, it's time for you to go back to Bethel. So read with me in chapter 35 and verse 2. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods which are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever, wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods which they had, and the rings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was near Shechem. So I want to, for the next few minutes, look at these three things that Jacob tells his family to do. The first, he says, is to put away your idols. As we mentioned, Jacob was not aware that Rachel took those idols. But apparently at some point he did become aware. And so it wasn't just that Jacob had neglected to go all the way to Bethel. That wasn't the extent of his neglect. Clearly there was some spiritual neglect, at least as far as his household was concerned. Jacob is clearly aware at this point that these idols have been in their household. But now he realizes that if his family is going to go to Bethel and start, start a new life serving God, they have to first eliminate the sin in their lives. They have to get rid of these idols. The presence of these idols cannot continue if they are going to do what they need to do because they are going to prevent them from giving God everything they have. It reminds me of a, a passage in, in the book of Acts in chapter 19, in verse 18. Uh, we, we read about Paul and his work in Ephesus, and in verse 18 it says that many of, uh, of chapter, of verse 18 of Acts 19, it says many of, also of those who had believed, kept coming, confessing, and disclosing their practices, and many of those who practiced magic, brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. These new Christians knew that if they were going to continue to serve God, if they were going to be transformed, living a new life in Christ, they had to destroy the wickedness that was in their life, that it consumed their past life. And so it wasn't a scenario where we're just going to keep these around, they're valuable, we're going to sell them, get what we can out of them. No, they knew that this represented sin and wickedness, and so they needed to destroy it. And so in the same way for Jacob's family to serve God fully, there could be no other gods before him. They needed to get rid of their idols. The second thing Jacob tells his family is to purify themselves or cleanse themselves. Now, because of that sin and idolatry, Jacob's family was, was spiritually unclean. And we see the effect of that. We see the things that Simeon and Levi did. Therefore, they needed to purify themselves. They needed to be cleansed. They needed to not only get rid of those material things, those material representations of sin, they needed to 
cleanse their hearts. They needed to cleanse their minds of all impurity. And if we think about that, purification is exactly what happens with baptism. We read in the New Testament that, that baptism is not merely just a bath. It's not merely the, the washing of, of dirt. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 writes that baptism now saves you, not the remo remo removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Jacob is not calling them to be baptized, of course, but he is calling them to change their sinful ways, to be transformed in the way that a Christian is transformed after baptism. The third thing he says is to change your garments. Now, if you're like me when you first read that, that sounds a little odd. I, I think it seems a little silly, maybe in comparison to purifying yourself or getting rid of idols. I mean, why, why is that in the same list? But that's how dramatic this change needs to be. They're leaving their life of sin behind so much so that they're not even going to wear the clothes that they used to wear. This is similar, if not more extreme, than what we read about in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 10. God is talking to Moses and he says, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. So this change of their clothing was to represent that they were renewed, that they were on a new path, that they had left behind their past lives of sin. What we really have here with this passage is a perfect pattern for repentance. You see, repentance is not just apologizing and then doing the same thing over and over again. Repenting is, is a complete 180 degree turn and going in the other direction, leaving the past behind you, completely changing your heart and how you live. And so God is not just calling on Jacob to change locations, to change their, his residence. He's really calling on them to change their hearts. God's call for Jacob to get up and go to Bethel was more than just packing bags, more than gathering up the livestock. It was a call to change everything about his life and his family's life and begin serving God. Now, in the same way that God told Jacob to get up and go and to change his life, God's call for us is the same. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We don't have time to, to talk about everything that Paul talks about leading up to chapter 4 of Ephesians. But in verse 1, he says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve, preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Paul is encouraging his audience, to not just be idle, but to be active, to strive to live as God wants them to live. Again, serving God is not something that can be done from the sidelines, but for our purposes this morning, what I think is really interesting comes in verse 22 of chapter 4. Paul writes, Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Do you see the similar similarity there between what we just read in Genesis chapter 35? Jacob says, put away your idols. Paul says, put off the old self. Jacob says, purify yourselves. Paul says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Jacob says, change your garments. Paul says, put on the new self. And so Jacob, I think is, it's fair to say, he's talking in more literal terms than Paul is. Paul is talking in more spiritual terms. But the call to repentance is the exact same. As Christians, we need to first put off the old self, as Paul says. The first step to repentance is getting rid of the sin in our lives, the wickedness in our lives. 
Now for you, that's probably not a golden statue that's, that's sitting on your kitchen table. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's the friends you spend your time with. Maybe it's a relationship. Whatever sin there is in your life, you need to eliminate it. We need to get up and walk worthy of our calling and leave our past life of sin. Secondly, Paul calls, us, calls on us to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Once we have eliminated those outward acts of sin, those, those material manifestations of sin in our lives, we need to start to look inward. We need to change our hearts. You know, when you think about illnesses and disease, you don't, you don't cure a disease by treating the symptoms, right? You, know, you have to get to the root of the disease. And sin is exactly the same way. If we get rid of certain sins, but we don't address our heart, if we don't get to the root of the matter, then we're just going to find new temptations, new sins that will consume us. So we have to get to the root of the problem, and that's our hearts. And finally, Paul says to put on the new self. Once we've rid ourselves of the sin in our lives, once we've purified our hearts, once we've rid ourselves of those old clothes of sin, we need to put on new clothes. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 tells us that those who are baptized are clothed with, clothed with Christ. And that void in our lives that used to be filled with sin, it now needs to be filled with good. Worshiping God, being with God's people, studying God's word, serving others. And Paul tells us in, in verse 24 that when we put on that new self, here's what it should look like. Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we need to strive to look like Christ. So that is what God has called us to do. He's calling each of us to repentance. He's calling each of us to a new life in Christ. And if we're willing to, to do what he's asking us to do, if we're willing to get up and walk worthy of our calling and serve God and work for his kingdom, then he can accomplish great things through us. Now at the beginning I mentioned that when Paul was on the road to Damascus, Jesus came to him and told him to get up and go into the city. Well, shortly after that, Paul was told to get up and do something again. In Acts chapter 22, when Paul is recalling his conversion story, he talks about Ananias. And in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Paul says that Ananias told him, Why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. If you're here this morning and you recognize that there are idols in your life, that there is sin in your life, that you are separated from God because of that, then you can do the same thing. You can be purified, you can be washed of your sins, you can put off that old self and be clothed with Christ through baptism. You can begin a new life with him. There's no better time to do that than right now as we stand and sing. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, building us the two arms of God. From the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the Oh, <laughs>
Just a few things before we close out. We need to remember um, the Yancey family as um, our brother Bert has lost his, his wife, Nan. She passed away Saturday, so keep them in your prayers. Ask the rest of the clan what you can do for them. As I know she's a, she's a big loss to their family. Also, I want you to remember that uh, Jennings Norton will be having surgery sometime this month, so keep him in your prayers. As you've seen behind me earlier uh, in, in the announcements, Wednesday night classes will start at, uh, this, this, this Wednesday. We'll begin the new quarter. In the main auditorium here, there will be different speakers each, each, uh, e each Wednesday evening talking about, I believe uh, Jed called it, the heroes of the Old Testament. So this coming Wednesday night, I will lead us off with Jericho, the walls of Jericho. So if, if you don't know how small those walls were, if you'll study a little bit about the walls of Jericho and how uh, tiny they were and what such an easy task it was for God to, to tear those walls down. Also, uh, in A1, Jody will be bringing this lesson. I forget your topic. The Christian in two worlds. As only Jody can present. First, second, and third John. It's a study of first, second, and third John. Study of first, second, and third John. So, there you go. <clears throat> also, you can see behind me small groups will start on the 13th. Not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. Uh, we'll have different times. There's 1230 uh, with two classrooms here at the auditor here. Jared's going to lead one. Matt's going to lead one. There's one in A1 at 1245 with Jody leading that one. There's going to be a Zoom, which almost anybody can join that one if they want to, with Eric Dullerin's Dullerin. him. <coughs> There'll be one in the auditorium at 4 o'clock and then one in the auditorium at 6 again with me. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed it. Uh, our baptistry has been redone and it looks very nice. Um, if you want to give credit to someone for that, you can do that with um, Denny Hoare. Denny Hoare worked very hard on that. Um, they redid it one time, it didn't work. They redid it again and they've got it under control this time. So if you want to stop by and look at it or if you want to just call him or drop him a note saying thank you. We're ready to use it any time. Uh, Jared mentioned it this morning, so anytime. We only have two on the board back there for this year. Uh, we have been hindered this year, haven't we? Thank you so much for your presence. I'm sorry I rambled on a little bit. I wanted to throw those few things out to you. Um, be back Wednesday evening at 7. We'll have another service right after this one at um, 10.30. Okay. It is well. We'll just sing the first verse of this song and we'll be led in prayer.
say amen to that song. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to call you our Father. So grateful to be your children, to be a part of a family, to have brothers and sisters who are able to admonish, to encourage, to lift up so many things, so many needs, to be a light in a world that is dark. Be with us, be with your church, wherever the congregations meet, that we might be all that you, in your wisdom, formed us to be. We thank you for this lesson. We pray that we each will examine our hearts and repent in anything and everything as we need, that we might make that renewal, that you might revive us again. We pray, Father, as we have prayed for those that are sick, those that are hurting, lonely, depressed, whatever the needs are, we pray knowing that you know our needs sometimes more than we know. Be with each and every one. Be with the families, with the parents, with the grandparents to be able to bring up the children, their children, in the way that they should go. Through your word, always, we love you. Be with us now through this day. We pray that we bring you glory in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>